Hello, Reward Clinicians. This is Ali Nasir with another clinical tutorial. Internet is abuzz with questions about dystrophic calcification management as well as broken instrument removal. So what I wanted to do was to share with you a case where I experienced both misfortunate situations in the same patient. This is an old case that I'm resharing with you, and I figured it would be of some interest to you. This maxillary lateral incisor was referred to my practice for endodontic therapy and the providing of a post space for this patient. The patient was asymptomatic, and the general dentist had attempted to find the canal uh, for doing root canal therapy, was, but was unsuccessful, and therefore the patient was referred to uh, my practice in order for root canal therapy, uh, hopefully finding the root canal, and if not, then providing a long enough post space for his need for restorative needs. As you can see, the coronal area of the tooth does not have adequate structure and uh, the radicular retention was required by this dentist. Now, the tooth appears to have dystrophic calcification in the coronal area of the half of the coronal area in the root, and there is not a whole lot of tooth structure coronally. Now, normally teeth do calcify uh, from the crown down, so you can often find a remnant of the root canal, at least in the apical one-third or one-half of even dystrophically calcified teeth. Plus, don't forget that radiographs only have a certain amount of resolution so that what you can see in a radiograph does not necessarily mean that it's not there and uh, that it could be there. So usually, if needed, we can do the root canal using microscopic uh, treatment and uh, microvision. You're able to see a lot better and have a better chance at finding these canals. Now, it requires also an understanding of how you need to align yourself in these cases so that you don't actually create a problem while trying to find the root canal, such as perforations that can happen in a buccal or lingual direction when you don't have proper orientation because you've lost the top portion of the tooth. Now, it's also important to recognize that not all cases that are calcified require root canal therapy. If there is no symptom present and there is mere dystrophic calcification, that doesn't require necessarily root canal therapy to be performed. As you can see in this case, it was only required for the reasons of a post. So generally, I oftentimes see patients that have had a history of trauma and they're fully calcified. That doesn't necessarily mean you need a root canal unless there is a lesion or unless there is a need for internal bleaching, which is a whole different subject, which we will discuss in the future. But one of the important things in these cases is proper access preparation that can oftentimes be complicated as a result of our isolation. Oftentimes when we do isolation for root canal therapy, you may isolate a single tooth. And when a tooth is missing its coronal area, you lose all kinds of orientation and by isolating a single tooth, you are drastically increasing your chances of perforation as you lose buccolingual uh, directional clues that will help you find these canals with proper orientation of your burr. So oftentimes what I recommend in these cases is not necessarily to access without a rubber dam, but to use a split dam. Now, what we've shown this in a previous case, this is not this case, but uh, you can use this kind of a technique by applying the rubber dam in a split dam fashion with a lateral to lateral or canine to canine. It allows you to visualize also the gingiva, which is also very important as it gives you clues for orientation to find the canal. Now, of course, once the access has been obtained and, then, and you've begun your instrumentation, this is time to then proceed to use other materials such as opal dam that we've talked about in the past to then cover the gingiva so you can have a good secondary isolation for proper microbial control to do your actual instrumentation and procedure. Now, enough about this. Now let's go back again and talk about how do we actually find the root canal in such cases. Now, the key here is an understanding of the three-dimensional orientation of the root so that you can visualize the root in the maxilla or in the mandible, wherever it may be, and then um, have the best chance of directly getting there. That requires that you examine the radiograph properly in advance, look at the adjacent landmarks and orientation of adjacent roots that have coronal reference points. And then when you look at the patient, 
try to orient yourself by looking at the adjacent teeth and the surface of the tooth you're working on to get the best orientation. Now also what, one of the other things that uh, you can do during your axis preparation, and I normally use small burrs at the early stages, and then I move on to use ultrasonic tips, such as the E14D tip uh, on my Forza V3 handpiece, in order to very conservatively be able to get down towards the apex without increasing uh, my chance of uh, removing unnecessary dentin in any of the 360 degree uh, direction. So one of the things that will help uh, for you to orient yourself as you move down is num uh, numerous x-rays in almost the bite wing direction in a very straight uh, position and injection of a radio-opaque material into your preparation up to that point. Now, I use the bioceramic sealer, I use the BC sealer for my obturation. It's there, it's easy to place, and because it's hydrophilic, it's also very easy to clean out. So I, I stop it for every now and then, and I inject bioceramic sealer using the dispensing tip directly into the tooth and into the preparations that have gone on, and I expose a quick digital radiograph to then confirm my orientation. This can let me know as I move forward, so if I'm in the right direction or if I'm heading the wrong direction, so I can actually correct course and then move in the correct direction. This obviously only gives me information on a mesiodistal direction. I could be off in a buccolingual direction, but that is something that I'm hopefully keeping uh, attention to by, again, looking at the overall orientation of adjacent teeth as well as palpating the root uh, on the buccolingual direction and building a visual model of where the root might be in the bone. So I keep injecting BC sealer, move on, uh, use ultrasonic to very quickly remove the sealer. Uh, ultrasonic and water will very quickly wash it out. Then go some more uh, and then inject a little bit more, take another x-ray until, as you can see here, I've injected it. And now I'm starting to pick up, actually, sometimes the sealer can just get into that canal and you can see the beginning of the root canal. And that becomes a fairly easy uh, point at that point to find the root canal. Now, these are microsurgical techniques. And it's not necessarily something that someone without a microsurgical microscope can also achieve, but if you do have the benefit of magnification and illumination in combination with this technique of injecting the sealer as you move forward, and again, it's not supposed to be under hydraulic force, it's just injecting it passively. So you're not trying to lock it in and inject really hard as though you're trying to uh, fill the whole canal with it. This is just an injection so that you can just get an impression of the canal that you've prepared and then move on by gaining that information. Uh, to, to change course and move on. So once you find the canal, then it's important to start by stiffer files, sizes six and uh, 10 stiff files, and move your way up. Now, in this case, it comes now to the second point of removing a separated instrument. What I did is I moved pretty well from a size six to a size eight and then si size 10. Uh, however, uh, and then to a 15, I tried to also use a size 17 hand file, which I had lying around that I hadn't used uh, a long time ago, and that was a flexo file size 17. And unfortunately, this file was uh, fairly old. I hadn't used it in a while. It had been sterilized inside one of the foams, one of the endo ring foams, and it had created some rust around it. So immediately upon placing it in the, uh, in the canal, and one rotation, and it unfortunately separated right in the canal. So that's obviously a very uh, unfortunate uh, situation, and I'm sure anybody um, out there uh, you know, would, would very quickly get a, a, a rush of cold sweat building up in your head. You can see here that this, uh, this file separated, actually a, a large segment of it separated. And here's the radiograph that shows uh, this separation. And you can see that it's a fairly large segment in there, uh, but it's just a little bit deep and beyond the area of reach so that I cannot fully grab it with any instrument to remove it. So here it is at a higher magnification. With the microscope, you can actually see it. Uh, and generally, when you can see the shaft of an instrument, you can easily uh, or more easily remove it. So visualization is the first rule of determination if a file is able to be removed or not. Anytime you see the file, usually the ultrasonic and water is a good enough um, uh, method of just putting it next to the file and using ultrasonic and water, it'll float it out for you. 
Um, here, however, because of the history of the file being kind of rusty, um, what I was worried about is if I were to actually apply ultrasonic energy to it, it could shatter it and I could end up with smaller fragments that would be more difficult to remove. So what I decided to do was to use one of the um, very old techniques of removing this type of an obstructions in the canal, whether it be silver points or files or any other uh, material you're trying to remove where you can actually see the segment or a little portion of it, was to use the good old technique with crazy glue. Now, cyanoacrylate is, gives you a fairly good and quick bond that allows you to bond things to um, these types of broken instruments. And the technique that's been described in the past is you take a a hollow tube. In this case, I simply use the, um, you know, you can use an etching tip that you use for your etchant or phosphoric acid etchant, and there are multiple sizes. Different manufacturer makes these in different uh, in gauges. The key is that whichever size you use has to firmly fit right over the, um, the broken segment uh, for a couple of millimeters at least, so you can have a good purchase and a grab. And then what you would do is you do remove this, uh, this hub and fill the inside, the hollow tube area, with cyanoacrylate or crazy glue. And then you place it immediately over the broken uh, segment again. Now, the trick at this point is to be patient. Oftentimes, people do this and then they don't wait long enough. You gotta wait a good few minutes here, two minutes to three minutes is basically at least amount that you need to wait so that you can, your cyanoacrylate can bond adequately to your segment that it's grabbing onto. Because again, you don't have a very large amount of material that you're grabbing onto. The longer, the better, so that you're really counting on having very close proximity between the cyanoacrylate and the, uh, the broken segment as well as the, the walls of the cannula. So by waiting long enough, then what you would do is you very gently try to remove this uh, material and afterwards you wait and then you suddenly remove it and comes out the broken segment very easily. And you can see that the segment is now lodged with the cyanoacrylate, the crazy glue right here in this hub. And that's done. Of course, the lesson to learn here is not to sterilize your files, your hand files, your stainless steel files uh, in sponges because they can rust right at the point where the sponge is uh, meeting the file um, so that they could separate this way and also toss your old files. And uh, this was, this size 17 is not a file that I use at all. I, um, I, I figured that I would, it might be helpful. Turns out that it actually uh, wasn't. But you can remove it like this easily. And now the, the canal is open. And I've done our secondary isolation using Opal Dam again. So I have proper liquid tight seal, even though I have a, um, uh, split dam, and I proceed to do my instrumentation to the adequate size that I want, and irrigation running a large volume of sodium hypochlorite to the apex, fit my master cone, and use the same technique that I've described many, many years ago, four cases of post is required, by fitting, drying the canal, and then fitting your post prior to the obturation. What you can do is you get the length from the post, and then you place the sealer, and you put your post next to your gutta percha, your master cone, and you um, notch your master cone uh, at you know the remaining length from the end of the post to the apex, so that when you place it in and cement it, this is using hydraulic condensation with biceramic sealer, with BC sealer, and then you press it down and you rotate it so you leave that segment down at the apex, so that you've done your post prep and your, uh, um, uh, your post space already uh, right after your obturation without the need to remove that gutta percha. And that's possible only when you're using cements uh, that are that doesn't require any thermoplasticizing of uh, the gutta percha, such as the BC sealer. Now, what you could do is you could lightly uh, heat up that interface of the gutta percha so that you can condense it down so you end up with gutta percha 360 degrees all around the, uh, the canal at that apical area of the post. So you don't have any... Uh, on set sealer exposed. But if you're not planning on cementing the post right away, then you can just condense it even cold and then complete the case. Here I show that the post is then refitted to make sure that it's seated to the end. 
Uh, again, as an endodontist, I don't cement the post myself, but I send this post to my referring dentist who would then proceed to cement it. And this is the final x-ray showing the post space has been prepared, the case has been obturated. Uh, and uh, here, what we learned basically is these two tricks. Number one, for um, calcified, dystrophically calcified teeth, you have to make sure you split them. You have to visualize adjacent teeth. You need to also get good orientation by uh, looking at the radiograph and then transferring that information in a, you know, a spatial way in your mind uh, onto the clinical setting and uh, then uh, uh, proceed to use the use of the BC sealer during your instrumentation. Use your ultrasonics so that you can conservatively prepare and go down in the correct orientation. And then when you find a canal, uh, try to slowly and serially enlarge it in size. And if you also do make the mistake of separating a file as long as you can see it, then you can remove it using this little trick with the cyanoacrylate that's been described in the literature many years ago. For Real World Endo, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope this information was helpful to you.